Go. Just making you do this slowly. Thanks for coming out. We are thrilled to host, and I mean thrilled, to host this very special event. Can you believe Kevin is, <laughs> Wilson is here? He's in Wake Forest. Um, Kevin Wilson is the author of the novels The Family Fang, a New York Times bestselling, adapted into an acclaimed film starring Nicole Kidman, no big deal, and Perfect Little World, as well as the story collections Tunneling to the Center of the Earth, winner of the Shirley Jackson Award, and Baby, You're Gonna Be Mine. He lives in Sewanee, T Tennessee, with his wife and two sons. So you may have heard last week Jenna Bush Hager announced nothing to see here as her Read with Jenna November book club. And it's going to be on the cover of the New York Times book review this weekend, which I can't believe. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Kevin <laughs> Wilson. <laughs> now there's really nothing to see here. <laughs> I read this book a few months ago and was sucked into the world. Number one, because it's not a political book and it's not Holocaust. I mean, we need to learn about the Holocaust, but there's like nine months I've been Holocaust. I'm like, how you doing this? So, um, we need more laughs, you know? And I tried to describe this to people, and it was like trying to describe the alchemist to people. I'm like, there's a boy and a donkey, and they go across the desert, and they're like, yeah. mm, but it's one of my favorite books. This is one of my favorite books. Oh, thank you. I told Gina that it was, um, she doesn't read fiction. I told her it was real. <laughs> and she's like, that's amazing. So I just, but I mean, you, you are crossing genres with this, and it's really good. Can you tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, so it's, um, um, it's a book about a woman, uh, Lily, who um, has kind of always gotten the short end of the stick in life. Um, she's come from a kind of rough background. Uh, no dad, a mom who didn't really care about her. Um, and she had this one moment, this one opportunity to kind of change her life and she got a scholarship to this um, private elite girls boarding school where she meets this very rich, very beautiful woman, Madison, and they're roommates and they become best friends. Um, and then as something happens and Lillian has to leave the school uh, and, and loses basically the one chance to kind of change her life, and she's just kind of fallen into a, a black hole. She works at two supermarkets, going back and forth, smokes weed all day. Whereas her friend Madison has married a senator who is on the fast track to become president. Um, and she has a beautiful little three-year-old boy and life is great. They talk by letters every once in a while until Madison needs Lillian. Um, and what she needs is her husband's children from a previous marriage are coming to live with them. Like two twins, Bessie and Roland, and they burst into flames when they're agitated. And that so, one does. And so over the course of the summer, they need Lillian to be a nanny mm -hmm. for these two kids to keep them safe, but more importantly, to keep Madison safe, right? So that nothing happens to her and her family and her designs on her husband becoming president. Um, so it's, it's a, I don't know, it's a book about in my mind, it's about two things. It's about uh, how we make a family, how we protect each other, and how we form these ideas of what a family is. And and then it's about friendship. It's about that weird pool of people from your past that can still affect you in ways that you, you can't quite imagine until they're right in front of you again. Um, and so that's that's kind of the book. And then the, the kind of easy way into this is like, well, you know, I kind of gloss over the fact that the kids burst into flames. And for me, I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed with um, spontaneous human combustion. I have been since I was really little, um, which is something that was super interesting to me. Um, and it was, it was interesting at first because um, I had so much agitation and anxiety in me that, that I thought that I would, might burst into flames. Like that seemed plausible, right, that that, that that would happen. So I was always just like kind of waiting for it to happen. Um, and then as I got older, I started thinking like, oh, I kind of wish that I could, you know, like, um, because I, I had to work so hard to keep my anxiety inside of myself. But there were times that in public where I just wanted to like burst into flames and be like, you see what you people have made me do. Like, you understand how like awful it is to be here. Um, there are times like in department meetings where I'm like, if I could just burst into flames right now, they'd be like, you can leave <laughs> and get out of here. Um, so it became really seductive, and, and so in my first story collection, I wrote a, a story about a, 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 a boy who's, whose parents spontaneously combusted at the same time and died. And I thought, okay, 
that was good. I got it out of my system. Um, and then I, and then in my novel, The Family Fang, there's a woman who's an actress and she gets a job as a nanny to a bunch of children who burst into flames. And I thought, okay, that was good. And we're done. And then I could just feel it. I was like, oh, I'm doing, I'm going to do it again. <laughs> you know, and, I, and I was like, I, the, the Family Fang was my first novel and I didn't know if I'd ever write another book. So I put like everything that I had into that book. And then I was like, oh, I kind of want that back. Like I'd like to take that back and do something with it. And so I just thought a nanny to children who catch on fire. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work my way through it. And, um, and you know, I have kids. Um, do they know about this? Yeah, they know. Children burning. I mean, living yeah. free. No, <laughs> my kids are pretty used to weirdness. You know, <laughs> they live with it. They live with me. Um, yeah. And so, but having kids. I mean, for us at least, um, they do feel combustible to me. Like children, their agitation, their tantrums, when you get them out in public, there's this sense that you just don't know what they're gonna do. And so it felt like a pretty apt metaphor for me for raising children is you're taking care of this thing that could at any moment burst into flames. And, and then there's that weirdness of like, well, why do they burst into flames? Is it because I, I did something to them? Did I genetically make them that way? And I have, I feel like I'm talking about this way more than I have. Like in the last two weeks, I've talked about it more than I have like in the 41 years that I've been alive. But but I, I was diagnosed as an adult with Tourette's. I didn't know. I always just had anxiety or OCD. You, could be, you know, hospitalized for that kind of stuff. And then as an adult, they're like, I think this is what you have. I've been neurologist. Okay, that makes sense. Um, but then I started noticing like our oldest son was exhibiting signs of of, of Tourette's. And this kid, why, why did I do this? Um, and so a lot of the story is, is that idea of like, what is your responsibility to the people that you've made and that you love to protect them? And how do you get over the worry that you're responsible for the unhappiness that's coming for them? And, that's and, so relatable. And, you know, yeah. and now Griff is 11, my oldest, my youngest is seven, and Griff is, um, I think I was really um, pretty full of myself that I thought that my genes were somehow gonna like, ruin him because Griff is like, he's his own person and he, he wouldn't let me ruin him. You know, he, he's, he's great. Um, he'll always live with that stuff, but he's not ruined. You know, yeah. he's, not, he's not damaged in any way that, that I'm not. So this book was really cathartic and helpful because as I was writing it, Griff was becoming his own person. He was less anxious and he wasn't having fits as much. And the Tourette stuff that we thought he had when he was eight did any signs of him. He has something else that's weirder, but it's not that. So I was like, okay, well, I'm good. I didn't. Know. That's like, that's beautiful. Oh, thanks. Really. I love that. Because, oh, you know, we you. all, as parents, we, we're afraid for our kids. We want it to, to have the perfect life. We want mm. them to be, to do well and to be better than us. And, you know, this, yeah, I, I admire you for coming out and saying I do have anxiety. And, you know, because, yeah. yeah. I it's think, more real because I don't know who doesn't. Yeah, I think so, that's the easier thing, too, is that you realize that everybody yeah. And so I, I did this uh, interview on NPR with Terry Gross yeah, last right. week, and, yeah, like, yeah. Yeah. and, uh, <laughs> and I, I got so many emails from people who were like, oh, I have this too. Yeah. Like, oh, good. And they're like, I'd love to talk to you on the phone and tell you the bad things in my head. I'm like, I, I, I'm okay with yeah. the It's good to know that we should respond, but I'm okay with the, no, I don't, I don't want to talk on the phone. Um, but yeah, that, that idea of just talking about it and making it known you realize that there's this community that's just waiting yeah. for you, right? That, that will immediately accept you into the, that world. That's great. Yeah. It doesn't make you bad or it's just, yeah. you know, yeah. dynamics yeah. or you have a broken arm. It's just, yeah. it's all the same thing. We're all born a little bit different. Yeah, yeah. 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 And that was, that's really beautiful. Oh, thank really. you. Um, did you have an imaginary friend growing up? No. Uh, I, I was too nervous to have a friend. Uh, I didn't know what to do with them. Uh, no, I just had me, and that's what I love. Yeah. Yeah. No, I never had an imaginary friend. I always hear about that. And I'm like, God, that would take so much effort. And, uh, it was nice for me. I, 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 I don't know that I could. I, I wouldn't be able to properly take care of them and be a good friend. Yeah. I like that you actually thought into that. Um, so tell us uh, about the news of family, the movie that's family thing. Oh, yeah. And how did you feel about that? Because, I mean, if you've read the book and then you see the movie, you're like, oh, this thing, the book was so much better. Did you feel like that when you put your baby up there? Um, it was weird. I, um, I wrote the book, you know, and, and 
there was no real expectations of anything. And, and then um, and then Nicole Kidman read it because she's she lives near Nashville, and so she heard on NPR that there was a Tennessee author that had published this novel. So she read it, and she really liked it. And so she called me and was like, "I'd like to option it. I'd like to make it into a movie. I'd like to be in it." And I said, "Sure." <laughs> you know, I mean, you can have it for free. I mean, what am I doing? We were in a coffee shop in Nashville, and I was like, "You can have, you can do whatever you want." <laughs> um, she was beautiful, and she was kind and really insightful about the book. She clearly read it and thought about it, and so I, I sold it to her and um, her production company. And I, and I thought that'd be the end of it. I have friends that have options, but nothing ever happens. Um, but um, she was pretty dogged and. It seemed like it was dead, and then she was like, I've got a script, and we had this David Lindsay affair, who's a Pulitzer Prize winning playwright, wrote the script, and she was like, well, we're moving forward, and then it kind of died, and she's like, Jason Bateman is gonna direct it and star in it, and so it kind of moved forward, and so Christopher Walken's gonna be in it, and they were like, we've got money, and it got made, and so they filmed it in New York. We went to go watch them film it. Um, it premiered at the Toronto Film Festival, Sit next to Christopher Walken and Jason Bateman. I mean, can you imagine your life being like that? No, he'd be insane. It was like winning the lottery, and it was great. And and that idea of like, well, what, what did they do to the book, or did they change it? Like, I, I don't, I really don't care about that stuff. Um, yeah. Like, to my mind, the book is always the book. Like, no matter what they do to the movie, my book doesn't change. It's my book, and and the movie is something different. And I kind of like that. I kind of like when. Adaptation is neat to me. You take this thing that exists and you turn it into a new form for a new medium, and I don't know. It's it's I'm okay with that. You know, yeah. I, I never had a moment's anxiety about what's going. Is it going to be bad? Is it going to be good? Um, is Nicole Kidman and Jason Bateman? Yeah, like, what was that? You know, like, it was it was great. You know, they were saying words that I had written in my basement in Swanee, Tennessee. You know, yeah. I was at the Toronto Film Festival, and Jason Bateman was like, "Here's the author," and I stood up and everybody clapped and. I was like, who, who would have ever imagined this? So yeah, I, I'm okay with whatever came up. And you're still doing really nice. this. <laughs> no, I don't know the name. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, it's it's one of the nice things about living on a mountain in Tennessee is that nobody cares. Like, you know, yeah. like being book famous is the best kind of famous because nobody knows what you look like. They don't know who you are. Yeah. Um, it's fine. Yeah, I just go. And I have to say, like. Almost all the authors I meet are just like you. They're just very <laughs> humble. What can I do to help you? you know? Oh, so, sweet. That's good. Yeah, yeah, it's really nice. So, how, what is your writing process? Do you wake up in the morning? Do you plot it all out? Do you? No, I never write. Does it uh, come to you? Yeah, I, it comes. I, uh, so, I don't write very much at all. I don't write every day. I don't write every week that. or every month. I write about two months out of the year. Uh -huh. And mostly because, I mean, I have kids and. And you love to play with them. I love that yeah. part of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, my kids are. The focal point, and mm -hmm. and um, I'm lucky that I, I write because I love it. Um, and but um, but but my kids are more important to me than yeah. the work, and so I make time for the work when they let me make time for it. So I don't write very much. So what I've learned, um, because before I had kids, I wrote all the time. You know, I just wrote obsessively because it's the it's the most wonderful thing, and I love writing. I think I'm happiest uh, when I'm writing. Mm -hmm. It's when I'm most calm. Um, but with kids, I can't do it every day, and so what I have to do is I have to write in my head, and so I write all the time in my head. When I go on walks, when I'm just sitting around, I'm thinking about the story, right? The next story I'm gonna tell. So then when I sit down, I write it really fast. And so I wrote this book, um, almost all of it I wrote in 10 days, just, wow. just from start to finish. I just, I just wrote it really fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, I would wake up, uh, I rented a house in Black Mountain, North Carolina, I wake up at 7.30, sun will come up, I'd write in bed, because that's how I write, and then the sun will go down, and the house get dark, and I'd put the computer away and go to sleep, and then I'd get up in the morning. I did that for 10 days, and I had a book, and it came really fast, and yeah, was, I wish I could do that all the time. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so so I just write in my head all the time, and then when the kids give me that those, those you know, seven to 10 days where I'll go away, and my wife takes care of the kids, and she goes to write, she's a writer, and I'll take care of the kids for seven to 10 days. We try to do that two or two times a year. That's heaven. And I just write really fast. I know, like, if I'm like, this is all you have. This is all the time that you've got. <laughs> like, you can't mess around, you can't talk about writer's block, you just have to, you have to make it happen right now. And, and I work really well like that. Yeah. yeah.
But you're always thinking about it, so it's not mm -hmm. like... Yeah, there. always. It's just just constantly telling that story to myself over and over again. I love the cover of this book. <laughs> <laughs> that is so great. I love it too. And you just told me a little while ago you're going to get a tattoo. Yep, I have like, so I have the family thing with kids on my arm. That's awesome. and I don't, yeah, so, so I'm going to get, I have one lady that I started with her in Chattanooga and then she moved to Atlanta and I got more and then she moved to LA, so I have to like, so I have How to did you come up with this? Like, did you I did, it? no, they never, I have a, a woman named Allison Saltzman, she's the cover design artist at Echo, has done every book of mine, mm -hmm. um, and, and every book is different and I love her and I trust her entirely, whatever she does I like it. Um, and she was really great with this because the very first thing she said was, um, I can't have a kids on fire on the cover. It's just not possible. And so they, like the first round of covers, it was um, a series of pictures of toast, very, very light all the way till it was burned, like that many pictures. Um, but, but the, but the echo didn't like that. They felt it was a little too kind of stuff, like just kind of static. So then she had these really crazy, beautiful paintings of these children, kind of really colorful, like children making messes, and the girl had a lion's head. Um, and I liked them a lot, but they thought they were too arty for the book. And then she made a fire extinguisher, uh, putting out the title, and they were like, nah. And so finally she found online what looked like an old ad for fire retardant clothing, like from the 20s, and she, that's this little boy. And she took it. It's an artist named Christian Northeast, and uh, she was like, "Okay, I'll put a kid on fire." And once <laughs> it, everything just clicked into place. And I think it's good because um, there's this. It's it's not a surprise at all in the book. Like the heart of the book is that kids burst into flames, and I kind of like that it's on the cover. Like I want people yeah. to know that going in. I don't think it spoils anything. It made me really happy uh, when they just put awesome. a kid on fire. <laughs> I, got what I, I got what I wanted. It took six drafts, but I got I got what I needed. And I genuinely like the kids. You know, I feel that. Yeah, they're they're great. Yeah, I love them. They're my kids. <laughs> so, um, how did you did you always want to write when you were growing up, or no? You, I always to put wanted, yourself out there like that. That's a lot of anxiety. Yeah, so. I, I I wanted to read. Yeah. I never wanted to write. I loved reading. It was the thing that made life tolerable. Right, mm -hmm. reading was the thing that kind of got me through how difficult the world was for me. And it wasn't until high, the end of high school, maybe college, that I started writing. And I was like, oh, this is nice. And, and I mostly started writing because I loved books so much and I loved certain authors so much that I wanted to write something that connected to them. Like not, not, to, not to be on the same ground as them, but just write something that connected to them in a way that was meaningful to me. And then I started writing and I was like, oh, this is like, you can take stuff in your head and get it on the page and that was really cathartic, like it helped. I was like, oh, I don't have to keep it all up here. You know, I can put it on paper and then it goes out into the world and it gives me a little bit of freedom from it. Mm -hmm. So then writing just, and I don't know, people, I know, like, I, I do think writing is difficult. Like, I, I, don't, I don't think that's like crazy to say, but when people say like they hate writing and that's their job, like I can't figure that out. I love it. Even when it's hard, I love it. It's like the one thing I think I'm, decent at and it's the one thing that really truly makes me happy yeah so so i would write and there'll be a time where nobody wants to read what i write and there'll be a time it'll come everybody falls off right like um and i'm fine with that like to, it won't i won't stop writing yeah. i'll just write for me yes, and I'll, I'll be as happy as i am now like, yeah. like um th there was this um interview with a jazz musician named sonny rollins who i really love the saxophonist and he can't play anymore of his hands and the interviewer was like well it must you know even though you can't play now it must give you so much joy to know how many people you you've made happy with your music and he's like not really and they're like what and he's like you know i mean if somebody got something out of it that makes me happy and it's great but i did it for me you know my art was not servitude i always got more out of it than the audience did and and i love that idea of that art first and foremost is the thing that i make for myself and and uh, if I can make myself happy, then I hope the rest of the world will like it. But, but at the heart of it, it's, it's the thing that I do because it makes me happy. Um, and I wouldn't do it if I, if I didn't like it, if it wasn't, if it wasn't this transformative thing. Yeah. Now, what did your wife, how much she write? She writes poetry. Um, 
it's nice we're not competitive in any way. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so she writes. Long poetry about you? No, no, never about me. Always about feral children. <laughs> her book is her her manuscript. It's her. She's published two books, but the third is called How to Make a Wolf, and it's all about our boys and oh, awesome. how feral they are. Yeah. <laughs> We have the same subject matter, we just come at it from different forms, yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, I love this. I was going to ask you, well, yeah, I did ask you, it's yeah. page from page 158. Yeah, yeah. Because this... So it, I'll, I'll, give you just, I'll give you a little bit of backstory, because I don't think it's spoiled. Again, I, I just, I don't think you can spoil anything. No. If the book is good, it's you'll be fine. And so hopefully the book is good enough that it doesn't matter. But, um, so these kids burst into flames. Lillian's job is to protect them. There's this guy named Carl who's kind of like a political fixer, and it's his job to kind of make sure the kids don't ruin the, the senator's reputation. He's a real square, and Lillian's not a square, so they hate each other. And um, Lillian and Madison used to play basketball in high school, and the scene just before this, um, they played a game of one-on-one -on -one and realized how, how badly they wanted to beat the other one, and, and Lillian got um, hit in the eye with an elbow, and her whole face is swollen. Mm -hmm. and so Lillian is getting hurt over and over again. Like she's just like a walking wound. So Carl shows up with what they hope is maybe a solution for these kids. All right. So uh, Carl comes over, and the kids are in this little guest house. We're going to the library, I said, and the kids did their weird shimmy dance, and I wondered if that's what they'd been taught was dancing. When Carl showed up, we were all dressed and ready. The kids' awful hair slicked down and styled like they were in a Duran Duran cover band. I had tried to put makeup on the bruise, but it had made it look worse somehow, almost like I was faking an injury, so I rubbed it off, which hurt like hell. Dear Lord, Carl said when he looked at me, what happened to you? He immediately looked at the kids. What happened to her? He suspected them entirely. Madison hit her, Roland said. Basketball, I told him. It's fine. Yes, Mrs. Roberts plays to win, Carl admitted as if my face getting smashed made perfect sense to him now. Did you put ice on it, he asked, and I just made a face. Carl was holding this giant black bucket. What's that, I asked, changing the subject, and Bessie shouted, it's ice cream. No, Carl replied, his face so pained, like these feral kids actively caused him real and lasting trauma. It's not ice cream. Why would you think it was ice cream? It's in a big bucket, Roland offered. Uh, I kind of promised them that we could have ice cream, I told him. Well, it's not ice cream, sorry. What is it then, I asked. It's stunt gel, he said. Remember what we talked about? Oh, I said, that's a big bucket. Well, I had to buy it in bulk, he said. I have six more buckets, five gallons each in the garage, so it had better work. <laughs> he pried open the bucket, and we all looked inside like it might hold the soul of an ancient king. But it wasn't exciting. It was just a big bucket of gel. It looked like a big bucket of, I don't know, drool. The point is it looked gross, and we were supposed to slather the kids in it. This is stuntman gel, right? Carl rubbed a little on his index finger and then clicked open a lighter, the flame nearly an inch high. He held his finger right over the flame, then directly in the flame for about three seconds. Nothing, he said. It's good. It smells funny, Bessie said, holding her nose. It actually smelled kind of like eucalyptus, but it was overpowering, so much so that it seemed unsafe. Okay, Carl said. So I talked to my buddy, and he said we just apply it directly to their skin. And yes, he says that it's safe, and that should do it. And we just reapply it throughout the day, I guess. You guess? I said, you don't know. Well, he said, I couldn't tell him the real reason for why we were getting it, could I? And stuntmen don't just walk around all day with it on. They do it for a specific scene, a single shot. But yes, it's mostly just water and tea tree oil with some scientific stuff added to it. It's safe, I think. Why are we talking about this? Bessie asked, slowly backing away from the bucket. It's for you guys, I said, to help keep you from catching. At this point, I didn't want to say fire around them if I could avoid it. I just called it catching. This is an extra level of security, Carl said. And I so badly wanted Carl, that square, to shut up. He wasn't helping. I don't want to put that stuff on, Bessie said. What about the fireman stuff, I asked Carl. No, Max, he replied. I'm still waiting for it. Why is it taking so long, I asked. First of all, it's only been a few days, okay, Lillian? And how easy do you think it is to obtain it? Like, do you think I can find child sizes of Nomex clothing at Walmart, like for tiny firefighters? I'm having to get it altered. It's complicated. I'm being pushed to my limits in terms of thinking creatively about our situation. He looked a little frazzled, actually, his hair not perfectly combed, and so I put up my hands. Fine, I said, I'm sorry. Thank you for all that you are doing. 
but an even cube. Okay, kiddos, I said, let's just try it. It's like a science experiment. This will be our science lesson for today. You first, Bessie said. Oh, yeah, of course, I said, angry at the reversal, but acting like I'd already thought of it. Of course, I'll go first. I looked at Carl and he blushed a little. Then he dipped his hand into the bucket and took a sharp breath. It's cold, he grunted. The gel was weird and viscous and he started to apply it to my bare arm. It was so cold, just so weirdly cold that it kind of felt good. He rubbed up and down my arm, coating it, then he did the other. You want to do your legs, he asked, and I shook my head. That's, this is good for me, I said. He held up the lighter and flicked the flame back into existence. Don't flinch, he said, it doesn't hurt. He held the flame directly under my arm and there was this weird moment where I was certain that my skin was burning, that I was on fire, but I just gritted my teeth and realized that no, I was fine, I wasn't burning. And even for a few seconds, it felt amazing, like nothing could ever hurt me. Was this what the children felt when they were burning? I had no idea, but I wished it would last forever. Woo! <laughs> There's a moment in the book where she's got the kids and she's trying to think about how to keep them from catching on fire and she just makes a list and it's like um, therapy, uh, firefighter clothes, stuntman gel, uh, fire extinguishers, damp cloths, and, and it's in the book, but, but before I wrote the book, that's what I did. I made a little list. I was like, how would you care for fire children? And I just made this long list. Like, hey, if you had found it, like a that scrap of paper, you would think I was insane. Right? It was like, what? therapy, prescription medicine, you know? Yeah. What the hell is this about? Um, but that's, you know, the only way I could figure out how to take care of fire children was to believe that I had fire children and just work my way through it. And that's, that's a kind of thing with fantasy and science fiction, right? It's like you just, you just, it doesn't exist, so you just try to make it up as you go along. Well, that's really what it works. Is. Thanks. And it's fantastic. I want to, do you want to um, ask any questions, Ava? Yeah, there's never questions.